How was your week? Cool. Then it went sideways. Not in a good way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what about you? What about you? What about you? It's going. Yeah, going, right? It's just going. Yeah. <laughs> Get in there. That's good. And what about everyone on this side? Good. Okay. And going well. Going well. And you? How is your week? Or how is your week going? Good. Awesome. So, um, just as a means of catching up back, who can share one or two things that we talked about last week? that you remember or something you did not understand or something you understood that stands out for you that you, you want us to, to learn about. Yes? All right, so if, if you understood what we shared, then can, can, you, can each of you maybe just tell me one thing you learned last week? Just one thing. So we have to look, about, look at the culture of understanding the Yes, yes, right? yes. And what is the cultural instance we used last week? What, what is one cultural thing we talked about last week? We talked about the yes. Man Yes, yes. And then, yes. In, some, in some place, yes. it's a terrible thing to do. Even though they do not know yes. the situation yes. that's surrounding the issue, or who actually killed the dog. Yes, yes. So in some area, it doesn't mean anything. Yes. In others, it, it does. Right? So if we just take that sentence like that, we will judge the man as being a very criminal or a very cruel person, right? Yeah. Just based on that fact that the man killed the dog. But if we are able to understand the statement in the context, it will be much more helpful. Not so? Yeah. How often do we, even like, let's take the story of the, a man kill a dog and look at the scriptural passage. How often do we, like even just a verse in the Bible, we don't look at the, the verse. We just take a portion of the verse. Not, the, not even the whole verse. But sometimes we base, we emphasize just a section of the verse that seem very relevant to us. And we leave the other sections out of that. And we don't look at the verse in that. And our impression of the verse is just that single fact of it. Hmm? Have we ever had that experience before in our lives? Or, or have we seen it before somewhere? Have we ever been influenced somehow by that? There is a high possibility, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes, take for uh, which verse can we use, in fact? Let's give a verse, any verse. You know, a lot of people, I think we talked yes. about this on like Jeremiah 29. Right? Yes, 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 I that's one. We, will be, right? we talked about that one yes. where it was in context of yes. Yes. the Lord wasn't bringing them or making them prosperous yes. right away. Yes, that. yes, so. yes, that's, that's a great verse. And also, you remember, uh, I will make you the head and not the tail. Should be the first mm -hmm. and not the right. last. Mm -hmm. All right? And we often use that to imply all right, our position of dominance and authority and our position of always being successful. And sometimes when we read that, we don't look at it as to whom that verse applies, what is the condition, what kind of people God is speaking about, and what are the conditions that are attached to that. But we just, you know, some, this is what I've noticed in Christian circles. That quite often we want the blessings of the verse, but sometimes we don't even take the responsibility attached to that verse. Mm -hmm. All right? We just let the blessing portion. All right? 
Like if you, if you, you, well, some of you may already be doing so, some of you may not be doing that, but if you preach regularly, or if you engage in preaching ministry regularly, let me make a confession to you though, that for my first year in Canada, I asked God many questions. <laughs> All right? That God, I know what you've been doing. I've seen you do miracles. I've seen you do great things. But why is it that nobody knows me in Canada? Nobody cares about me. Nobody even wants to listen to me or nothing. Not for myself now, but for God's ultimate glory. I used to ask myself, I said, no, I think, I'm, I think it's time for me to go back to Africa. Because I'm there, I know that I'm very known. <laughs> and I know that. <laughs> I, I will have to say, no, I, can, I cannot really come today. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Because I cannot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all came to that point. Yeah. We wish we would go back. Yeah. 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 I don't like it. I think, yeah. You know, Jeremiah 29 11, when it yes. says, um, I'm yes. the thoughts and plans I have for you. Yes. I found that, well, I mean, it, it was when the Israelites were in exile. Exactly. And in punishment. So the yes. verse means that, um, yes. that God was telling them that they actually had to go mm -hmm. into. Um, exile to the captives to yes. be a blessing there. Yes. So it was the I heard it, it wasn't really what they wanted to hear in yes. a sense because they yes. didn't want to have to go to captivity for yes. seventy years. Yes. So in the context of that verse, yes. some people say it's the this the, the whole context of this verse is actually yes. the meaning of it. It doesn't mean that yes. it might not mean the plans God has for you is yeah. what you might want to do or yes. be in. So, yes. Yeah. Yes. I think, uh, I think yes. Uh, it was when God says, mm -hmm. you should not go back now. Stay yes. Here, yes. Now, stay, yes. Stay there, yes. Prosper there. Yes. And they were saying, what? Yes. We can't go back. Yes. We stay here. Yes. Stay in house. Yes. We do everything as if we belong yes. to this place. We yes. want to go back. Yes. But God says, yes. Stay in Canada. Stay, stay in Canada. Yeah. Stay in Canada. Yeah. Don't. Don't go back. Yeah. I have a plan for you. A plan for you. Yeah. It's different from what you think. Yeah. <laughs> Very true. And, and like, let's go back. And like, that verse though is, 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 is really, it's really, it's really, it was really a tough verse for the yeah. children of Israel. Yeah. Do you remember what, what they say in Psalm? How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? So, so, so for the, so, so, yeah, yeah, so, yes. Yeah. So for them to be, for God to tell them to stay in captivity, was, the, was like, maybe humanly, was the most difficult thing God could be telling them. Because for them, they loved being back home. They enjoyed the joy of being home. And the comfort and the blessing. Take, for example, you are a Canadian. And God takes you into exile, into Burundi. Have you heard of Burundi before? Or the, he takes you to the, um, the nation of a thousand hills. Do you know where is that? It's Rwanda. Rwanda, yeah, takes you there, all right, when they had the genocide, I will never forget, when I, when I was in Kigali, um, I went to see, they have made a museum, like a whole big place, um, this is fairly big, uh, a little smaller than this, but it was literally where they dug the mass grave, the museum is right on top of the mass graves, so, and then they have a section of the, like a room like this, you still see the skull of the people, their hands, their feet, their legs, just still there. You see the bones still there. As a remembrance, every April, um, yes, every month of April, they observe a week of remembrance of that, of what, of, of, of that. But today, that same nation, God has transformed it radically. Yeah. It's a great example. Yeah. yeah, one of the most thriving nations in Africa. All right, imagine God takes you to such a difficult place like that. Says that, and then you, you, you are. I want to go back to. I need to go back to Canada. I will get free health care. I will have this and that and that. And then God says, "What? Stay right here in this nation. I have a plan for you. All right, right here. In fact, to 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 make it much more serious, you are going to build city here. You are going to build a nation right here. You are going to build everything right in this nation and remain here. All right. So it's very important. The context is everything. Context is critical in our understand your scripture. And if we don't understand scripture, from the lenses of context, we will always get it confused. Alright? And that is why, you see some people, what do they do? They are just jumping from one scripture to the other. Just jumping like, 
All right, just like they are, they are, they are Kobe Bryant, good basketballers. Just jump from one section to the other. Like on Sunday morning, jump from Genesis straight to Revelation. Just always jumping. It doesn't help a lot, though. It excites the people, but it doesn't produce maturity and growth spiritually. Do you get that? All right? So um, where did we end last week? We talked about five things, right? When you are considering a text, there are five important things that you should look at. Mm-hmm. Number one was what? Um, read in light of the entire scripture context. Read in the light of the entire what? The, the whole Bible. So whenever you take a verse, what is, what is the main message of the Bible? What's the main, main message of the whole Bible? Love. Mm-hmm. Love. God's plan of redemption for mankind. That is what the whole Bible centers around. All right? It's the unfolding of God's plan to redeem humanity. All right? When man fell in Genesis, in a, we have what we call the proto-evangel. You've heard of that before, right? The proto-evangel. All right? The proto-evangel. All right? Very simple. What does the word evangel mean? Evangel. What does that mean? Good news. <laughs> Evangel simply means good news. All right? Good news. Evangel. That's why it comes. Okay, I don't even know how to spell news anymore. Evangel simply means good news. That's what I mean. When you say evangelism, it's what? Proclamation of good news. the good news. That's what we do in evangelism. It's the proclamation of the good news. And that good news is not necessarily that God is going to give you three cars, two houses, and five jobs, and three children. That's not necessarily the good news. It may be a portion, a small element of the good news. All right? There's a, the better news is what? That what? Man is sinful on his way to hell, and on his own, he can never meet the requirements of God. Even the greatest level of man's righteousness cannot meet the single level of God. Let me take for you a, 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 a verse. As I, as I says what? He says what? The righteousness of, of man is like what? Filter. It's like what? <laughs> it is like what? Filter. Okay. Do you know what, what filter rights mean? We're well, coming back to this, right? Do you know what filter rights mean? What, what is filter right? Isn't that the, for women and their time? It is exactly that. It is 100% that. 100% that is the meaning of that word. That's the meaning of that word. But, but when, we say, when we hear filter rights, all right, what do we think about? The one at the doormat. All right? That is what our, our understanding of it is. But the, the context of that verse is exactly, it's not me who said it, it's exactly what she said. What? That's what I mean. Like, your highest level of righteousness is like that. All right? So when God sees you, like whatever works you are doing on your own, that is why, like today, gradually, the gospel of works is coming into the church. Do you know that? Yeah. The gospel, what's the gospel of works? Come and sow $5,000. God is going to give you $50,000. Come, come, and, come and give this prophecy so that God can give you a prophetic mark. You, all right, it's like works because I gave. If you give one thousand, you get a one thousand blessing. If you give two thousand, you are going to get a two thousand blessing. If you give five thousand, you are going to get a five thousand. So we are comparing. No God, I need to have a big blessing from you. So what am I going to do? I'll give a big offering. All right, gradually we are bringing works into the church. Even now, Pentecostal churches, gradually we are bringing the doctrine of that our whole Christian life should be based on what the proportion of our works. Sometimes you may even give one cent, but God can bless you more than someone who gave the most. <laughs> All right? Today, earlier today, before I came here, uh, my wife was not originally supposed to come with me, but before I came here, we, we are in the process of trusting God for God to provide an uh, instrument for our church. We need at least speakers and uh, a mixer. So we went to go and look somewhere, and then it was late. I was supposed to take her somewhere else, then before I come, it was late. So um, on Sunday, we get to talk with the church, trusting God. We don't have money, right? 
But we have to talk about the issue about that God had. Because I believe that God will use his people to provide. All right? <laughs> All right? So, so, so like, uh, um, but like, even I'm talking about this whole issue about proportionalizing all the gospel of works, I'm even reminded that on Sunday, we should be careful even how we tell the people. So that we don't say, oh no, okay, like, we, we, we went, we have an estimate of about 3,600 or 700 or so. So we don't say, no, whoever gives that $3,000, your blessing is going to be maybe 30,000. But we can willingly tell the people or whoever God wants to use that. Give, because it's a good thing to give into the house of God. All right? I'm not saying give me a money I want to put, to put in my pocket and go and eat it, by the way. All right? I say give them, let's buy this thing all of us so that we can enjoy good worship and glorify God in an honorable way. All right? That, like, why I was even talking about that, it just crossed my mind now that it's good to be careful that. I hate, for me, what I hate, I hate in the church, I must tell you that, I hate manipulating people. I hate it to the greatest extent, like, try to deceive people, manipulate. When we want to do deception, let's go outside. This is the place of truth. The church is the ground of truth. When we come, speak the truth to the people. And the people should respond to the truth. Not like do gimmicks and cheat them and steal from them and like do all kinds of things and fake it and so on. As if God cannot do the real one or the true one. Alright? Like you have to like, alright, swaggle them and manipulate them and this and that and the rest of that. Yes. You, people should give joy, joyfully to God. Honestly, willingly. Because if you know your relationship with God, you give to him, my friend. Unless you don't have a genuine, uh, an honest relationship with him. Yeah. All right? So coming back to even the issue about the filthy rights is that God says that our highest level of righteousness, no matter what we do, we, most of us, uh, we think that, oh no, it's what people wipe their foot on. And sometimes it is even better. In your house, your filthy right will be very clean and very proper because you put it in your dry machine and washing machine. But when the Bible says what? Filthy rag, that is the concept you should always think about. All right? That's, there is nothing you can do on your own that can please God. Nothing at all. All right? Yeah. So from today, if you, if you have that mentality of holier-than-thou mentality, when you leave from here today, just leave it right in this house and just go home, <laughs> release from that. Because there is no amount of effort or works on your own that can ever please God. The only thing that allows our works or our efforts to be pleasing to God is what? The precious blood of Jesus. The, the finished work. What Jesus did on the cross was what? Complete, finished, total. We can add to it. We cannot move from it. It's, it is, that's what he said. Jesus did not say, I am finished. He said what? It is finished. It is, finished. It is complete. What he did on the cross was full. He paid the total price for that. So you don't have to pay a second price for that. All right, so number one, whenever you read scripture, is that read in the light of the whole Bible. And I was talking about proto-evangel. All right, the word proto-evangel, the concept, um, I think it's Genesis 3.15. Let's, let's read Genesis 3.15. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. This is chapter 3, verse 15. Are you there? Yeah. What does the Bible say? And I will put enmity between you and the woman. Yes. And between your offspring and hers. Mm hmm He will crush your head. Yes. And you will strike his heel. Wow. He will do what? Crush your head. And what will you do? The serpent, the serpent will do what? Strike his head. What will the serpent do? The heal. And what will the offspring do? Crush the head. The head. Do you know who that verse refers to? Jesus. Jesus Christ. That's the first time the gospel is announced in the whole Bible. The first time. The good news. People say the gospel is never announced in the Old Testament. That is the first time in the whole of it's in the Old Testament, first book of Old Testament, third verse. This is the this is the basis of the gospel. This is the first time that we have a clear indication of Jesus Christ in the whole Bible. All right? He says what? He's speaking. Who is, who is, who is the father referring to? You, who's speaking there, by the way? Let's do a little bit of review here now. Exegetical studies here. Who is, who is speaking there, by the way? Who is speaking here? God. God, God the who? Father. The father. All right? 
God the Father is speaking in this verse. And who is he speaking to? Who is, who is the listener there? Man. Hmm? Who is he speaking to? No. No. Who is he speaking to? To the serpent. To the serpent. All right. He's speaking to the serpent. Do we get that one there? The first thing, who is speaking? God. Do you remember I told you these are questions you should always ask the text, right? That's the way you get to understand the text. Who is the one who is speaking in that verse? The Father is speaking. Who is the Father speaking to? The serpent. Why do we say so? Is it because I just look at the verse and say that? No, because it said to the serpent. Yes, he says, and he said, let's read a little bit upward, um, and we get to see that. Verse 14. What does verse 14 say? Wait, okay, let's stop a little bit. So do you see here, I think I've told you this. If I've not told you that, I will tell you today. We, we said that what? When you are studying a verse, say for example, I'm studying verse what? 15. It is important for me to read what verse 14 or verse 13 is going to say yeah. and to also read the corresponding thought that will come in verse 16 in order to get a proper context of verse 15. Do you understand that? So sometimes you may not get a full context and in all, every time you read a verse or whatever, read that verse, but then stop there, go back to the corresponding verses to that main verse. What comes before and what comes after? Because most of the time, the Bible is continuing a line of thought that you cannot just grab just from one verse, just like that. Do you understand that? It's the same thing. If I'm, if I'm studying a chapter, for example, not always, it is, this is not always the case for every verse, but most often, this is the applied principle in Bible interpretation. Alright? For example, if I'm reading a chapter, say if I'm reading, uh, for example, I don't want to go too many places here, but let's stay in that verse, but I just want to show you something. In Genesis chapter 22, what does the Bible say in verse 1? After these things. After what? Okay, wait. After what? These things. After these things. Alright? For most people, this is just a beginning statement. I just continue with my reading. But the first question you should ask yourself is that, what things? Alright? Because it's not just there because of a... We are just coming there because we just want to have the rest in the Bible. After these things. So you ask yourself, after which things here the Bible is referring to? Alright? And the things here in verse 22 here, like chapter 22 here, refers to from verse 11, from chapter 11 up to chapter 21. Do you understand that? The things that has been referred to is actually from chapter 11 up to chapter 21. Ten chapters that Bible is going to talk about, these things that are, he's just mentioning here, these things here, that he's going to talk about. God says, after all the things that he has done to who? Who's, 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 the, who's the main person in, the, in chapter 22 there? It's the, it's the story of who? Abraham. Do you remember that? Do you get that? It's about Abraham, right? Chapter 22. And this is the sacrifice of Isaac, or Isaac, whatever you call it. All right? Do you get that? Or am I confusing you a lot? <laughs> All right, so in chapter 20, 22 here now, he's going to base this on 22 here now, based on the many things that have happened in the life of Abraham. How God had to call the father of Abraham. Do you know first that God did not call Abraham first? It was the father that God called. Do you know that truth? That it was actually the father of Abraham that was called. And he, he did not finish the mission, but God had to assign that mission to Abraham. Do you know that? Yes. Do you know that? Yeah. You haven't read that before your Bible. Yeah. I'm very impressed. You haven't read that before. Genesis chapter 11. Yes. Genesis chapter 11 tells us about that. Actually, it was Abraham's father. You see, now we are going to go all over the place. Like we are going to be moving, jumping here and there. I don't like that. But let's go, let's let's maybe let's go first to Genesis. We are coming back to Proto Evangel if I forget, okay? okay? But let's go to Genesis chapter chapter eleven here. From verse one. I will tell you the verse now. Mm. 
Yes, uh, from verse 27. Yes? Can we read? Who is Terah? Uh, Abraham's father. The father of Abraham. Abraham. All right. The father of Abraham is called Terah. And then what happened to Terah? Terah had how many sons? He died. He had how many sons? Three. Three sons. What's the name of the three sons of Terah? Abraham, Abraham. All right. Haran, Nahor, and Abram are the three sons. In verse 20, it tells us what happened to Haran. Sorry? Yeah, later on, yeah. that will be changed. Yeah. Right? But here we see already that one of the brothers of Abraham is going to Abraham is, 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 is going to die here before his father. Yeah. Bible tells us. Sorry? The youngest son here, in this context here, who is called Haran, he's going to die before his father, who is called Terah. And where is he going to die? In their native land. The native land is called Ur of, of the Chaldeans. Do you get that? So he's going to die in their country here, called Ur of the Chaldeans. Yes, continue. And Abraham and Nehor yes. took them wives. Mm-hmm. Yes. And the name of Nehor's wife. Yes. Milka. Yes. The daughter of Haran. Yes. The father of Milka. Yes. The father of Easter. Yes. But Sarah was barren. She had no child. Verse thirty-one. Terah and Terah his... took Abraham. Yes. His son, Who? Lord, the son of Haran. Yes. His son's son. Yes. And Sarah, the, his daughter-in-law. Yes. His son Abraham's wife. Yes. And they went forth with them. From Ur of the Chaldeans yes. to go into the land of Canaan. Do you see that? Mm-hmm. And they came unto Aaron and dressed there. Do you get that? Mm-hmm. So here, it was. Are you all following me? Yes. Are we together? Mm-hmm. So here, Terra, Terra was the one who took Abraham. It wasn't Abraham, Abraham planned to go to Canaan. Do you get that? Mm-hmm. It was Terra. The father and Bible commentators believe that God has actually called Terah to that mission because we see that the unfolding of it was God's plan to take him to Canaan. That is why we read chapter 12, verse 1 and verse 2. God will have to come, but we are not going to read that yet. Let's finish with, with this one yet first. But God had to what take Terah and place that desire in his heart to leave from his homeland. Why did he have to leave from his homeland? Because the people of all of the Chaldeans were idol worshippers. They worshipped false gods and evil gods. Alright? And God wanted to take them from that nation, to take them into the nation of a place where he will, they will have to meet with people who believe in the true God. Do you understand? I'm cutting a lot of details from that because this was actually not part of our text for today. It's, not, it's just like... <laughs> Uh, uh, um, an extra thing that we're looking at. Alright? So, he had to leave them, but then while he was going, the Bible says what? In verse 32, what? He took Terah is going to take who? Abraham. He's going to take who? Lot. Who is Lot? Abraham's cousin. Abraham's cousin. And what is the name of the father of Lot? Who was Haran? The last son of Terah. The last son of Terah. And what happened to him? He died. We have that basic understanding in our mind, right? That he died. And then, because he died, the father took him. Or eventually, when the, and in verse 32, the Bible says what? So the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah did what? He died in Haran. The name of the place is also called Haran. Not, not his son now, but the name of the place is called also Haran. So he died in this place called Haran. Do you understand that? Is it clear for us? So when Abraham died, uh, when uh, Terah dies in, in, in this place here, then the Lord now turns towards the Lord. Terah's own story is finished. The Lord now turns towards the son of Terah. And who is the son of Terah? Abraham. Abraham. Lord is the grandchild. Alright? So he turns to Abraham. Abraham who is the son. 
And then verse 12, chapter 12, verse 1 tells us what? They say what? Let's read that, please. Now the Lord has said unto Abraham. Now the Lord had said to Abraham. Do you, do you get that thing? They says what? The Lord what? Had. The Lord what? Had said. Had said. So what you should understand, the person who is writing this Bible here is writing based on a previous experience. It is not that God is speaking to him now here. The writer is saying God had actually spoken to Abraham before. He's only narrating now what was said in the past. Do you understand that? Do you get that? Very important, right? So now the Lord had said before, maybe before even, maybe before even the death of, of Terah. Maybe. I'm, that's why I'm, I'm speculating here. I say maybe. Or maybe just after the death of, of Terah. God spoke to Abraham. And God is going to tell Abraham seven things here. He said, number one, what should you do? Get thee out of thy country. Get from your country, number one. Number two, and from, the kindred. from your people that know you. Number three, and from, from, your your father's father's house. from your father's house. Number four, what should you do? Go on to the land. I will do what? I will show you. Into the land that I will do what? I will show you. So, what do we see here? We see an act of God gives an instruction that requires a level of faith. Do you see that? Most of us who want to work with God when everything is already clear, like, like clear, like whatever. But sometimes it takes faith. All right? All right? You know, that, you know like, I see the more that when you, are, when you are serving God or in public ministry or public preaching is that. Most often, the Lord will may tell you something or show you something. Sometimes when you look at the physical circumstance, it isn't the reality. You may not see it like anything is going to happen. But you need to believe God, especially when God has spoken to you clearly. In your spirit, you see it clearly. You are convinced about it. But physically, there might be limiting factors. Do you get that? Do you understand that? I'm going to give you two examples. Two Sundays ago in our church, um, I was sharing the word of God and the Lord in, laid on my heart strongly that there was somebody in the church that there was a lady, in fact, in the church that God wanted to visit and manifest his power over her life. And then when I knew, I knew for sure that it was God who was speaking. So I declared that there was a lady here in this church that God is meeting you right now at your point of need. Whoever is that lady, let the Holy Spirit select them right in our midst. And I said it in passing, and I prayed, and we continue. Nobody fell down. Nobody shouted. Nobody screamed. Nobody said amen. Nobody did anything. Just said it, and we continue with our preaching message. All right? <laughs> like some people say that the, 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 the pastor disgraced himself on that Sunday. <laughs> Because, because, and even what happened was that our secretary recorded that portion of the message and sent it to me on that Sunday. He recorded it, sent it to me on Sunday. I didn't, nobody came to me after the service to say that word was my word or how you spoke in my life or whatever. <laughs> All right? You do, you think that this thing is like you didn't hear God all that day at all, right? But then on a Friday, I got a call from a lady in the church who had an operation on her leg. She's been suffering. She could not work for several months. Got a call that. Actually, the word you said on Sunday, it was for me. But when I left, I wanted to test it to see if it was true that it was me that God was going to intervene in my life. When in between Sunday, she had gone, I think, the week before to the doctors and doctors said, maybe we might need to do a second surgery to recorrect the problem. All right? But, and she, couldn't, she was having pain in the leg and the rest of that and so on. But then she, she left it from that Sunday when she came to church. After that, the leg became, she could work on it. While she's not been working for several months, she could start to work on it. So, she, so now on Friday now, she was, she herself was even surprised at what was happening. So she called me and said, I wanted to keep this until Sunday, but 
What I have seen happen in my life between that Sunday when, when that was spoken to you. You say, you, do you remember what you said on Sunday? I said, yes. He said, until Sunday between now and the, until here, God has actually healed my leg. And she came on Sunday, walking on the leg, on Sunday to give a testimony in the church. <laughs> All right? But, like, physical, I did not know who was the person, right? Number one. I did not know physical who was the person. But I knew clearly that it wasn't a man, it was a lady. Based on what God had told me. All right? And then number three also was that God was going to do his work. But the faith, I just declared by what faith, I could not see it. But physically, there was no, nobody there that I could pinpoint that this is the person. Nothing happened. <laughs> All right? But it takes what? Even as you go out, I'm not just saying just say things from your heart or your head. But sometimes you have that deep impression in your heart that God has spoken something to you. You know that. It's like, it's so clear that you don't have any doubt about it at all. Amen. Do you get that? Amen. Do you understand that? Yes. All right. Let me tell you just another story. All right. And I don't say all these things to, show, to, to even try to impress you that I'm powerful. I'm this. It's not about you. Any, whoever called you is never about the person. It's about God and his glory. All right. There's a lady in our church. Our church is a very young church. right? We started it this year. So it's a very small, young church um, um, that um, the Lord is putting together. But there's a lady in the church on uh, the week before. She had a dream. And then in the dream, I was telling her that. I, I call her Mama. See, it's your friend. You know her, in fact, your friend. So if, it's, if I'm lying, just call her after here. At her. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so there's at least one witness here. So you can call her after here. At her. I'm not going to call her name, but at least I told her it's her friend. She knows her friend. All right? Your Congolese friend. Okay. Yes, fair and complexion. That's the one I'm talking about. All right? So, she, 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 and she had a dream. In a dream, this is what happened. God told her that. I was telling her in the dream. Actually, God did not about her in the dream. That this Sunday, I just feel that the presence of God is going to be strong in the church. That God is going to do wonderful things in the church. And then she told me, say, Pastor, please pray for me concerning this. And then I'm trying to tell her, what's going but she's emphasizing so much that I should pray for her, repeating so that I don't forget to pray for her in the church. Say, because she really knows that God is going to. But what happened? On Saturday or so, she got sick. She could not come to church on Sunday. So she wasn't in the service. She didn't tell me that she had this dream that God's going to do something. Sunday morning, we went to church, right? I was just, I just intended to preach the message that the Lord had impressed in my heart about the Holy Spirit. Because we, we studied about the, God the Father, God the Son, and this past Sunday was saying about the Holy Spirit. So I just shared the message of the Holy Spirit. But towards the end of the message, all right, I didn't have that as a plan. Towards the end of the message, the Lord impressed my heart that there are a group of people here that you have to pray for today. Towards, right towards the end of the message. All right? So it wasn't something that I planned to say I'm going to do this and the rest of that. So, Towards the end of the message, I just said what God had laid on my heart. We began to pray that day. God did great things. But now, on Wednesday, he did a lot of things in the church that day. That even we had to far exceed our time, more than one hour of time of our worship together. But now, I went to visit her because she was sick now on Sunday, right? I have not seen her. Now, we're talking. Then when I went to visit her, then she was telling me now about the dream that she had the other week before. Saying that, Pastor. God really laid on my heart. I'm so sorry I was in church on Sunday. But God really laid this in my heart on Sunday. How was the church said this on Sunday? <laughs> I started to laugh. <laughs> so like, how was it? Because God, this is what God was saying. This is what I was saying. And then I said, I show a clip of one of, one of what was um, uh, what the secretary had sent me during the week. I sent her a clip of that. And the lady started to cry throughout. <laughs> to her. See, I really, I was sick. I really wanted to force it to come because I knew that I was she was like, she's angry, but she's sick. But also at the same time, also, um, the point I'm trying to make here is that whenever it talks to walking with God, it requires faith. All right? Because I did not plan it to pray for people on Sunday. It wasn't the plan of the service. It was the first Sunday we had different things to do after that. But knowing that when God gives you an instruction, to be able to obey. That's the whole point of what I'm saying is what? The issue of faith. Being able to act on what God is saying. All right. Do you get that? It happened to me today. Yes. In a church. Yes. A group of students. Yes. Came into. Yes. Church. Yes. And there were many. They were going to say. Mm-hmm. 
And there was one particular boy sitting in front of me. Mm -hmm. God just said, this boy is something else. Mm -hmm. I wanted to tell the teacher, mm -hmm. watch over this boy. Mm -hmm. It was not long. Mm -hmm. The next station, mm -hmm. the train stopped and two police came into the came into the train mm -hmm. and started asking for ticket. Mm -hmm. This boy did not have, he has a fake ticket on him and he looks so troublesome. I wanted to tell the teacher, watch over this boy because he's going to corrupt these other children. Yes. So I just, so I don't know how to go to the man and tell him. Yes. But before you know, trouble started. The Lord started to confirm it right before your eyes. Do you get that? So it takes faith. faith. So God has said to Abraham, let's come back to our text now and focus on our text. These were just extra things of our, of our conversation. But let's come back here. Bible says, now the Lord has said to him, get out of your country, get out of your people, get out of your family, get out of your kindred to a land that I will do what? Should I will show you. you. So even if you are going, as you are going to leave this Bible school here, there is a land or a ministry that God has for you. That he needs to show you. But sometimes you may never see that land until you take a step of it. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Yeah. There is a ministry or a dive or a level that God has for you. You may never ever, if you just sit down and just fold your hands like that, and you may, you may just enjoy serving tea and coffee always in the church, and that will be all you'll be doing in the church for the rest of your life. But until you take that step of it, you won't see what God wants to show you. Do you understand? Then now, this is the verse, this is the part we like, we like to claim. This is God's promise to him. That God tells him, number one, I'm going to do, what am I going to do for you? I will make you into a great nation. Into a great nation. Number two, what I, what I do? I will bless you. I will bless you. Number three, what will I do? Make your name great. Number four? You will be a blessing. And number five? I will bless those who bless you. Number six? And who curses you, I will curse. Number seven? Do you see the seven promise that God made there? Do you see that seven four promise? You can preach a message on Sunday on one of these days. That I want to preach today on the seven fold promise of God to Abraham. <laughs> All right, seven points. You don't have to look for fifty texts here. You have seven interesting points here that you can preach a very powerful message on. Do you get that? With a background in mind, number one, God says what? What is what is the seven four promise? Number one? when you read the text, it's it's quite in interesting, right? Number one, it says what? What will I do to you? I will make you a great... Let's write that down. Maybe it might help you. The sevenfold promise of God. Seven, sevenfold promise. Promise of God to Abraham. Number one, what does God say? Number one, I will make you what? I'm listening to you. I'll make you what? Into a great nation. A great nation. So, what is going to be this great nation here that God is referring to? People. The people. But which people now? Israel. Israel. So, the great nation that God was referring to here was going to be Israel. Israel. Alright? How is it going to unfold to become Israel? From Abraham. Who is Abraham going to get first? Isaac. And then who again? Jacob. Yes. And then who again? That's it from, from Jacob, then who again? Twelve. Twelve tribes. So we have Jacob here, or, 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 or Israel here. Then we have the twelve tribes that will unfold into that. But you see, separate, there, is, there is at least here the generation of Abraham. This is the second generation. This is the third generation now before they get to experience that. Hmm. Fourth generation. Alright. Abraham, first generation. Isaac, second, third generation. Then fourth generation here. Do you get that? So number one, he says what? I will make you a great nation. That's the first thing here. All right? And if you have time to explain to the people what is this great nation here, to make them understand it. That is why you can fight against Israel, whether you like them or not. Just forget about them. You can find them. Number two, he says what? I'll make you a great nation. What's the next thing? I will bless you. I will what? Bless you. Bless you. To be blessed does not mean that you necessarily have to give the person money. It means that I will empower you. Blessing is like what? Empowering you. Empowering. <laughs> what? Blessing is what? 
What are, what we are trying to do to you in this school or in this class here is to what empower you. When you go out there, I, I may not I, I may not at the end of this class give each of you maybe hundred dollars or one thousand dollars or whatever. All right, but we are going to empower you with knowledge that will help you for the rest of your life. Will set you apart. Set you apart for the rest of your life. Alright? I will bless you. Number three is what? You will make your name great. Name to be what? Great. Great. I will make your name to be great. The name of Abraham is a great name. Alright? That is why when we pray, when the Israelites, do you know how the Israelites, when they pray, do you know what, what do they always refer to? They say what? God of Abraham? Isaac. God of Isaac? God of Jacob? God of Jacob? Alright? For them, that is the reference they make to God. I will make your name great. And then what else again? Number four. This is the promise, right, of God. Yes? And you will be a blessing. You will be what? A blessing. You will be a blessing. So actually, you are not really blessed until you are a blessing. Do you understand that? So the real blessing is not just about us only. The, the, the real value of true blessing is same in how many people you can bless. Alright? And blessing here, don't just limit blessing to money. There are many forms of blessing. <laughs> Alright? Many forms of blessing. I will make you a blessing. Yes? Number five. Bless those who bless you. Bless those who bless you. Bless you. And then it comes with the contrast of that. The co this is what is said, but then there is a contrast of bless those who bless. What's the contrast? Curse those who curse you. And then number seven is what? All, all nations. There is a church in Calgary called All Nations, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So this verse is not just for them, it's for all of us. All nations of the earth will be blessed through you. Do you understand that? All nations of the earth will be blessed through you. Every nation of the earth will be blessed through you. So the next time you say, Abraham, blessing am I, or you are claiming the blessing of Abraham, ask yourself, what, what, was, what did Abraham do first? He had his part to play. Do, do, did we read about that? What did God tell him? Number one, you should leave what? Your country, your kindred. your kindred, or your people. Number three, yes, leave your country, leave what, leave your father's house, leave what, your relatives. Your relatives. And then what? What should you do? Go to the land. I will show you. You see that? You see? Yes. So you, you, if Abraham would have stayed in, in, in all of the charters, in this pagan nation, he would never experience the blessings of God. So even as we close before you go for a break is that Abraham obeyed the instruction of God initially, right? True or false? True. Mm -hmm. True, right? But he did not obey fully. All right? Mm -hmm. God spoke to who? Abraham and told him to Leave. What did Abraham do? He, he took Lot with him. They got to him go with. God didn't tell him don't carry Lot. <laughs> but God, God, if God wanted him to carry Lot, God would have told him. God did not tell him out to him. Yeah, because the yes. thing is, yes. when when Lot <laughs> was there, yes, that uh, <laughs> Lot was in the care of Grandpa. Yes. No, Grandpa is dead. So but there is also another yeah, brother. Yeah. What about the other grand brother? What about the other brother? Oh, he was gone. The father, uh, mm. the father of uh, the father of the one who was the Rebecca later. He was gone. He could, he could have gone with him. Lot could have also stayed in. It doesn't make sense. Because he ended up in yeah. nonsense. Yeah. 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 The, yeah. Thing yeah. Is, the thing is, mm -hmm. they, were, they, were, they were connected. Uh -huh. when, when the father died, mm -hmm. Lot was with Grandpa, mm -hmm. and Grandpa. Grandpa was with Abraham and leave your father's house. Yes, your father's house, but he still wants to carry his father. He didn't say carry your father's house. He still wants to carry them. Since Lot was under his care, that he died. Abraham was a little scared. Leave 
your relative. Yes. Do you see that? So, they say, leave your relatives, but he's still taking his relatives with him. <laughs> say, leave them behind. <laughs> but no, oh God, you know, I love this one. I will leave the other relatives, but I will just carry this one relative with me. No, because he thought that, oh, maybe because this one is younger, maybe, maybe. Your relative is your relative. <laughs> you know, he's a no fan. Your relative is your relative. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Do you get that? But now the point I want to make so that we don't come back to this Genesis passage is that he, he took love with him. But in addition to that, many times Abraham doubted the promise of God. Most of the things that God has said about him is that what? I'm going to make you great, make your name great, and I will bless you, bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you. One of the most evident things that we see is what? In regards to Abraham's wife. All right? He goes... And then what happened? They asked, who is this? Oh, no, she's my sister. And rightly so, he was her brother. But in, on the other hand, he's lying. So he feels God in that level. But number two, you know, you know when number two, we read, yeah. when we read here, he said that Sarah yes. was the, the daughter of... It is true. That's why I said she was rightly... Yes, wife. yes. It was his wife. Yeah, yeah. But he used this what is more convenient for him. I'm trying, I don't want us to come to this passage, so I'm cutting. Yes. I'm trying to cut off a lot of details from this so that we don't come back to it and go to what we have to do today. Yes, please. All right? So, <laughs> so number two, number three also is that what, what did he do? Instead of him being obedient, God promised that God is going to give him the child of promise, Isaac. Instead of him being obedient with, with, with God's promise for him, what did he do? He went to follow the advice of his wife. Do you, get, do you get that? He followed the advice of, of his wife. The most easiest route of that. So, base, that is why, like, I, I have a pastor who says, he says that, he says what? He says, as a man of God, I will listen to the voice of God more than the voice of my wife. Really? Because, because your wife will, your wife will not want you to suffer. She doesn't want anything bad to happen to you. She will not want you to put your, she don't want you to be ashamed. She don't want you to be this great. You don't want to have the ministry. Or you stay on outside. You have to come home now. Or the food and this and that. All of that, right? All of the wife's side of it. So let to listen to the words of God more than the voice of your wife. <laughs> Otherwise, you cannot, you cannot amount to a great thing in the ministry if you listen to the voice of your wife more than the voice of your wife. Most of the men of God before. Yes. Did not marry. Like, like Paul, take for, take for example, Paul, Paul says... Some of the prophets, yes. they did not marry. Yes. Because yes. if they had married... <laughs> uh, well, yeah, they didn't marry. They didn't marry. They didn't marry. No. Like, you know... Only, only, it, uh, it was that uh, Isaiah. Hmm. <laughs> do, you, do, Sam, do, Sam do you know that... Do you know that your wives... Like, the, the wives have a very powerful voice that if you are not careful, you can be deceived. Like sometimes it can either be just a voice, maybe a kind admonition, or even a threat. Like Job. Oh, right, yes. What's going on? All right. All right. So, respect your wife, honor your wife, consider your wife, but you shouldn't listen to, to your wife at the same level of God. And, and the wife needs to know that, that you are not God, by the way. All right. You need to know that this is God's I respect and honor you, but I should listen to God more than I listen to you. All right? So, he then followed after that. So now, when Bible talks about, after these things, Bible is referring to all the mistakes, all the challenges, all the failures, all the difficulties, everything that, God, that Abraham had done. God now wants to test him to see if he is ready for God's plan for him. Do you get that? So the test now, God has tried him in many cases. He's often filled, but God wants to see now if he's really, 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 really able. What, what chapter was that? Chapter 22, verse 1. Okay. Alright? So he says, after these things now, after these things now, God is going to do what? Going to test Abraham. The word tempt is some version is actually test. Alright? Test Abraham. Do you get that? Alright? Do you get that? Because it's going to test Abraham. So we're going to stop the here. Test went to do. Yes. Now that is what made God to be. Do, do you know what was God's declaration in that? He said, God says now, now I know 
And all along, God was saying that all along, you have really not met it. It is only now that I know, all right, that you truly honor or value me. All right? Based on this test that you pass it. Some of us in life, the reason why we are never promoted is what? We keep failing our test over and over. Keep failing out. The same test God is giving to you over and over, you keep failing it. How do you want to be promoted? There cannot come promotion, my friend. Until you pass, until you pass that test. <laughs> like, all right, I wish like, like I told you, right? Like, for example, in, uh, in Alberta Bible College, every week they give the students tests. The teacher is like, you have to correct a lot of papers every week, every week. So the teacher have a lot of work, the students have a lot of work. And then at the end of the term, because it's a degree program also, at the end of the, 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 the course, you also have to give them additional tests. If, if they don't pass that test, they cannot continue. Like most of them are going to be graduating with a bachelor degree in April. All right? So, and this is like the, the class I'm teaching now is like their last course before they go into the graduation of that. If they don't pass that, <laughs> I will see them again another time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, <laughs> and they will, they will, they will, they will, they will be, they will be swearing me that this is the teacher who made me out. <laughs> That's interesting, right? <laughs> so we have, we have to be considering that they can pass at least, <laughs> that they don't have, they don't have to. <laughs> All right. So, but like the thing is that the point is that if they don't pass it, they cannot go forward. It's the same in life and in ministry. If you keep failing the test that God is giving, I don't know what's your test. If you don't pass that test. Don't expect to be promoted. Let's take our break. We'll be back. We'll come back. Then we'll go into our content for today. This was like just our vacation class, right? Then we'll come into our proper class. Okay. Yes. 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 You are not ready yet. <laughs> Saturday. 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 My soul, my changer. Mm-hmm.